You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 23, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Pollen Food Allergy Syndrome. Our presenter is Adithi Nadu. She's a fourth-year medical student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. With us. She's a fourth year med student and uh, about to match into family practice. And uh, she is a fish rotation and is going to talk about oral um, allergy syndrome today. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so to get started, we'll be talking about oral allergy syndrome or pollen food allergy syndrome. It is an immediate IgE-mediated allergic reaction, which is localized and pretty much limited to the oropharynx. And this happens um, upon ingestion of a certain fresh fruit, nut, or vegetable in individuals who are already pre-sensitized to specific pollen allergy. For example, if you have a birch or a mugwort um, uh, pollen allergy, you might, up to 70% of those with the birch uh, pollen allergy can actually have PFAS. It continues to rise, especially because the number of inhalant allergies are on the rise, and it is seen more in adults than children. So usually you're going to see pruritus, tingling, mild erythema, some angioedema of the lips, oral mucosa, palate, throat, you can have small blisters, little papules that come up as well. And sometimes you might have like a, ch a choking or a throat swelling sort of sensation. It happens pretty shortly after ingesting the fresh fruit, um, not a vegetable. So you're looking at about five minutes into it, you can start showing signs of this. Um, symptoms do resolve when the food is swallowed. And this is attributed basically to the fact that um, the digestive enzymes and the gastric juices pretty much degrade the allergen once it is swallowed. So it won't trigger a response. Um, or continue to trigger a response. The symptoms can be increased during um, a pollen season because you might have like a boosting of pollen-specific um, IgEs. And it can be tolerated in cooked food, again, for the reason that these allergens are usually uh, pretty, um, get degraded by heat and uh, form of cooking. Now, is there's a question of systemic reactions. Apparently, less than 10% of the population done in studies um, could have had a systemic reaction, but this is more for, um, example, a local reaction. So they have uh, a birch allergy, and they have come in contact with apples or potatoes on their hands, and they might get a kind of like a contact um, reaction to that. Um, also, less than 2% in um, like a review of several studies done showed that two, less than 2% had anaphylaxis, but they attributed this more to having an isolated food allergy and not necessarily PFAS. So, Every, any time that happens, you have to look into it a lot more. So some of the risk factors are you can have a sensitization to, um, if you already have a, a sensitization to tree pollens, especially birch, a little less with the grasses and the weeds. Um, if you have sensitization to multiple pollens, your chances of having PFAS also increases. If you have symptomatic pollenosis, if you're having ocular, respiratory, um, uh, oral symptoms, nasal symptoms, then you're also at a higher risk. And if you're living in an area where certain pollens are more prevalent. So if you're living somewhere where there's more birch or there's more of the grass sub pollen, uh, you might 
uh, just have you might be sensitized more and have a uh, chance of PFAS. So I like the way this was said. So fruit and vegetable allergens are highly conserved and share varying degrees of homology with allergens from other fruits and vegetables as well as pollens. So this structural and functional homology underlies the extensive cross-reactivity which is observed clinically. So I left that as that was. So a little bit about the sensitization. It happens via the respiratory tract. Um, usually you're going to, so you're going to ingest, I mean, um, inhale, um, so you've got this allergen, um, you get these uh, specific IgEs that will go bind to your mast cells, your basal cells in the body, especially in the oropharyngeal mucosa, then it comes into contact with something that kind of looks like it, or it recognizes it, and then it'll trigger off a reaction, um, because they share a lot of, um, again, because they're homologous. Um, allergens are usually destroyed in the stomach lining, again, because they get degraded, and um, the dye pretty much uh, the proteolytic enzyme for breaking up. Just a little chart about it. Um, birch, for example, is huge cross-reactivity with apple, uh, apricots you hear about, uh, pears, celery, carrots, some spices, uh, mugwort with celery and carrots, and you get a syndrome called the mugwort celery carrot spice syndrome, for example. Um, grass to the melons, um, also uh, with ragweed you can get the cucumber family, zucchini, um, melons and plain to hazelnut and apple as well. So if you're a little more visual, then there's a little chart which has got like pictures on it. Um, you can look at that later. <laughs> Allergens in PFAS, just a little bit about it. So there's conformational B-cell epitopes. They're sensitive to heat, acid digestive enzymes. Therefore, they usually stick to the oropharyngeal symptoms. Um, the culprit for the major allergens responsible. So you've got this group called the PR10, the pathogenesis related proteins. Um, Birch is a huge one in this group, the BETG1 group. And then the next one is the profiling uh, group. Um, now, lipotransfer proteins, that's an interesting one. They're called nonspecific LTPs. And with this, uh, usually when you have a food, uh, food allergy, something a little more serious, vomiting, diarrhea, that sort of presentation, they, want, they look at LPP being a culprit. A little bit about them, PR10, uh, PRP10 group, which is a pathogenesis related protein. It increases in plants under stress, so when the weather is changing, um, pollution, anything like that that's putting stress on uh, plants, you'll have an increase of it. And again, cross-reactivity is due to the um, homology of the amino acid sequences and um, readily lost by heating. With the profilins, this one helps make the cytoskeleton in plants. Um, this is the this is also a certain type of birch, um, and again, it's milder reaction destroyed by heat. But with this, it's not the amino acid. It's more just a structural similarity that the body will recognize. So how's it diagnosed? So you're looking for a few things. You want to see if they have a history of symptoms of PFAS, first of all. If they have an evidence of an allergic sensitization to a certain plant food. Um, if they have evidence of allergic sensitization to a certain pollen. And if you know of a um, correlation between the two. History is important, history, history, history. So you want to know, um, so they'll pretty much tell you, OK, so when I eat an apple, for example, this is the kind of uh, presentation I have. Um, so you can get them to write, to have like a food diary of what foods will cause it, what foods won't. Um, and once you know that, and if they have a prior history of having allergic rhinitis or any sort of um, anything that you suspect, um, asthma, eczema, that sort of thing, presentation. And then if you want to go ahead, you can do an SPT. Um, here, commercial extracts are said to be pretty, not very stable, stable. so um, you want to stick to doing the prick by prick. So prick the fruit, prick the skin, that's a better way of testing for it. Um, with an IgE immunoassays, they say, obviously, if you suspect you don't quite know what the presentation is or what, they're gonna, um, what symptoms they're going to have, or if they're on medications that are just not going to allow for a skin test, you can go ahead and do an IgE immunoassay for it. Oral food challenge is the most definitive way to find out if there's something going on. So if you feel it's safe, you can go ahead and do that as well. Do it in clinic. Make sure um, it's under all precautions and supervised. Now there's this future test called the component resolved diagnostics that they're thinking to use for it. And with this, it's pretty good because I think it's more specific. It gives you, it kind of can tell you what the primary sensitizing allergen is and um, can also tell you uh, how likely it is that they're going to have a severe reaction or how how or what they're going to present with. So that's something they're looking towards um, doing in the future for PFAS. Management. Um, so educating patients on what's going on here and uh, what is the main reason that they're getting symptoms like this because it's odd for patients to, you know, have certain fruits that all of a sudden are causing these kind of symptoms. 
So just letting them know what's going on and what other fruits are in that category that can also trigger a response so they can be careful about it and watch out for what um, they're eating. Um, with fruit avoidance, that's the best way to go. The apples are not, you know, if it's not just not treating you well. Also, you can have some symptoms of nausea, uh, nausea because the allergy just hasn't broken down in the stomach. So just letting them know um, that sort of thing. So avoiding food is the best way to go. Um, caution with PPIs because this reduces your um, so the acids in the stomach. So you could so they aren't sure of what the presentation might be um, in patients that are on PPIs. Um, so some of the ther therapies for uh, with uncertain benefit. So you've got antihistamines. Um, being, so sometimes they say that antihistamines might help, but there's no recommendation of pre-medicating a patient with antihistamines just in order to be able to eat a fruit, for example. So they aren't very sure about doing something like that. Immunotherapy, um, in some cases, there has been a subset of the population that has had either resolved symptoms or lessened symptoms. Um, but it's great to do it for a patient that's got you know, pollen allergies on their own, but just to be able to do it for PFAS, there really isn't any studies done. Um, same with anti-IG therapy as well. They think that it might help, but um, are there, is it something they're going to do just because a patient has a PFAS? They're not really sure. And now, should a patient get an EpiPen? Um, sometimes they say that um, if a patient is really worried, you don't know what symptoms they're going to present with, um, if there's a chance that they might um, present it with something more than just the oropharyngeal, you might want to consider it. If they're having a reaction to that fruit vegetable um, in a cooked form, then you'd be worried because it's just not, you know, it's not as uh, legal as you think it is. It might be a lot more stable and you might consider doing that. And even if they react to, for example, the commercial extract where usually you shouldn't really have a reaction, then um, you could consider maybe um, getting them an EpiPen. Um, and yeah short presentation. That, that would be it. Those are my That's right. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you. touched on everything that um, is important. I think the big question to always ask in your mind is, in all allergy syndromes, is it safe for this person to continue eating the food if they want to? Right. I think it's tough, but um, I would say more than 90% of my patients I allow to and recommend more for just discomfort that they somehow process it, whether even sometimes just putting it into a smoothie if they want to say right. oh, strawberry smoothie is good enough. Um, peeling the apple too, do they say peeling it? Getting sometimes. Yeah. sometimes so. Peel, sometimes um, fruit that's um, newer versus older. Mm -hmm. so I, the most severe I have um, comes darn near anaphylaxis with bananas, especially if they're older. But oh, if it's a old. newer one, you could maybe need to go older. Is it getting browner? Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe it's under stress and it's all strong now. I don't know. Bananas are baby. But it is what's having a conversation about it. You don't want to necessarily take people off altogether. But some people can tolerate it out of season, but in season they have problems and they just eat it in season. And that's yeah. Wrong. So it's an individualized thing, but it is safe for some people to continue eating. So you have an EpiPen for that patient? Oh, cool. well, he's got EpiPen for other people. Very topic guy. Yeah. Okay. Good job. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences online allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>